So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our um, our mini school uh, this week. And I'm going to, uh, if anybody else missed maybe the previous slots, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So please go there. If you're not sure, please email us at info at Netflix and we'll uh, give you all the information where you can watch the previous sessions if you might, if you might have missed that. Um, last uh, previous session from Martin Bucher uh, handled, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Yopi Freer um, to take today's session and then at the end, you can type your questions as, as the talk progresses, at the end we'll take all questions um, at the end of the talk. So thank you very much, Dr. Yopi Freer, people aren't here to listen to me, so I hand over to you. Thank you, Yopi, take, um, yeah, okay, you're sharing your screen, so thank you. I'll yes. Okay, I'll mute myself and then you start. Thank you so much for your time, Martin and Yopi. We really appreciate your effort. Thank you very much for this. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Rene. I'm just double checking. Uh, can everyone see my full screen? You're not seeing the presenter view. Okay, I can see your screen. I saw Rachel Patzel is here. Rachel, can you give us a thumbs up? Uh, can you see the full screen? Okay, Justice, thank you. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you. Yes, we can see. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so this is the fourth lecture uh, of, from our uh, our little research group. Um, the, the first two lectures went around trees and genetics and uh, parsimony and uh, the very complex uh, computer science -y stuff. Then on the third lecture, I introduced you all to AS Review, which was using artificial intelligence to do um, systematic literature reviews, or at least the screening thereof. And in this session, we're going to be looking a little bit more under the hood uh, at the kind of artificial intelligence that was used in AS Review um, to make the, the screening process easier. And we're specifically going to be looking at active learning. Now, the, the first slide, or at least the second slide of my presentation, I already messed up. I see I didn't actually update the agenda with all of the different components. But uh, I'm going to introduce who we are, going to give you some background, and then just talk through all the technical side of things. And there will be a little bit of a demo at the end that you can also play around with uh, if you want to. So in terms of who we are, uh, again, we are uh, Professor Martin Booker and myself, Dr. Yapi Kreev. We are both, both NITEX associates. Um, Martin is involved in a number of universities uh, as well, both in South Africa and, uh, uh, and in Paris. Whereas I am based at the Northwest University, specifically in the Optentia and UDSC research entities. Um, so we've been working together for, for a while now. And uh, this is sort of part of the, the, the work that we're doing, uh, or at least one of the techniques that we use within the work that we're doing. As I mentioned in our last mini school, we looked at a system that allows you to do systematic literature reviews with the help of artificial intelligence. And the technique we used inside of that system was called active learning. And in this mini school, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what active learning is and what we can do with it from a more technical perspective. So where does all of this fit in? So we've got the field of artificial intelligence is sort of the, the larger field that we're looking at. Inside of artificial intelligence, there's machine learning. A specific kind of machine learning would be supervised learning. A specific kind of supervised learning would be semi-supervised learning. And then a subfield of that would be active learning. So I'm going to just talk through all of these. I, I'm going to go fairly quickly because I'm assuming that for this audience, a lot of this will be you know, information that you already know. Um, so, But feel free if you would like a bit more detail to, uh, to ask questions, and I can expand on it at the end. So in terms of this list of, uh, of knowledge, the first one we've got as the sort of meta area is artificial intelligence. And it's actually quite a difficult field to even give a definition to. There are a number of researchers over time that have given definitions, but all of them tend to fall short in, in one or more ways, depending on you know, how, how the field kind of builds over time. Um, it's it, it's uh, one of my favorite stories is actually, uh, or it, my definitions is actually from someone who was talking about Deep Blue and how there was this huge push for artificial intelligences to be able to play chess against grandmasters. And this was sort of at the forefront of what artificial intelligence was for years and years and years until someone actually succeeded at it. And Deep Blue was beaten by Gary Kasparov, oh, beat Gary Kasparov. And then when they looked under the hood, they realized it was just search algorithms. And then there was this question of, well, is our search algorithms really artificial intelligence when they're just algorithms? 
So in many ways, artificial intelligence is just a way for us to solve problems with machines um, in an intelligent way using you know, various techniques that we have in this toolbox of artificial intelligence. But I have added some of the more you know, common definitions uh, up on the screen, which you're welcome to look at, and all of them have their, their pros and cons. But in terms of how we use artificial intelligence, it is a very broad field. Um, and it encompasses a number of sub-disciplines. So uh, going down the list, um, you know, it's got machine learning inside of it, of which a big field is obviously neural networks and, uh, um, and deep learning. But you've also got computation, uh, ev evolutionary computation, vision, computer vision, robotics, expert systems, speech processing, natural language processing, planning and logistics. Um, and even in that, you've got you know, further fields that you can look at in terms of the application to things like games. Uh, you know, there's, there's just so many fields that are encompasses by this, this discipline. But the one we're actually going to be looking at is machine learning specifically. Now, much as with artificial intelligence, machine learning is uh, describing a whole different area um, of artificial intelligence that encompasses a number of different algorithms. Now you've got families of algorithms. So if you look at things like deep learning, inside of that, you will have convolutional neural networks, deep belief networks, et cetera. Um, you've got decision trees, which can be done in a number of different ways. Um, you've got you know, rule-based systems or expert systems. You've got regression uh, algorithms that you can use, clustering algorithms. And all of these form part of the machine learning algorithms collection. But when you start looking at all of these algorithms, you find that they, that they roughly um, organize themselves into three main paradigms. So under machine learning, we've got the three paradigms of supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Now, we're going to be talking specifically about supervised learning, but the other two fields are also very, very well researched and have their own uh, benefits of using them. Now, for supervised learning specifically, this is the one that is used the most. Um, it's sort of become the kind of bread and butter of, of machine learning. Um, and it's normally the one that if you're going to be starting out with machine learning, this is the one that you're going to come across first for the most part. And basically what you're going to do with machine learning is start with a number of labeled observations or records. So you're going to have um, a bunch of data that has labels associated with it. Or um, if it is some sort of a regression thing, it will be you know, a bunch of records that have a number of different um, features and then a target value that you're trying to get to. And you're gonna go work in a loop, okay? So you're gonna take um, your labeled observations and you're gonna use your model to make some sort of a prediction based on one of the records in your labeled observations. And then based on this prediction, you're gonna compare what you predicted versus what's actually labeled in the data set. And then if it's correct, you will reinforce the kind of learning you just did. If it is incorrect, then you're going to change your model slightly. And the whole idea here is to try and learn the underlying pattern that is inside of the data. Okay? So it's not going to give you any information that is outside of the data, but anything that is contained within that data set, that's what you're after. Okay? Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to say it again, it, it's sort of the bread and butter of machine learning, as it is the one that finds the most application in industry and even to a large extent in research. But it has the disadvantage of needing very large amounts of label data, especially something like deep learning is going to go with you know, just so many records. And although we do have a lot of label data available, it's not nearly enough for the kinds of problems we want to solve these days. So that's sort of supervised learning. Now, semi-supervised learning is a special kind of supervised learning that tries to specifically overcome this problem of needing you know, just massively large amounts of label data. So with semi-supervised learning, you're gonna try and take um, your data set and label some of it, not all of it, but some of it, and then try and generalize from that um, to the unlabeled data at the same time. Okay. Now, because we are looking at things from a, from a slightly computational science point of view, of computer science point of view, this um, is basically the mathematical definition of semi-supervised learning. 
So these, these terms all describe the field. And just to kind of describe them, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a mathematician. Um, so when I see things like that, I want to run away. But just each of these, uh, um, of these formula are just describing one of the parts of the system that is described by semi-supervised learning. So that first line is basically showing us that we have labeled data um, with an unknown joint distribution. Okay? So basically, we've got all these records, and each of those records is going to have some sort of a, a label attached to it. And that um, label describes uh, where it fits into our data set. Um, it's not supposed to be the unknown, it's the known joint distribution at this point because we currently know it for our labeled data. But then next, we've got the unlabeled data, and this contains the marginal distribution. Okay? So we don't necessarily know the, the full distribution of, uh, of X mapping to Y, we now only know X. Okay? So this is what we want to, to learn about once we've got our semi-supervised algorithm in place. And when we are taking the label data that we teach our algorithm on, and we want to apply it to this unlabeled data, um, we're gonna call that inductive learning, okay? Um, but that is applied to new instances, okay? So if we're saying that we've got this label data set of 500 instances, and then an unlabeled data set of another 1,000 instances. But after we've used you know, the 1,500 instances, we want to apply it to new data. That's going to be unlabeled, uh, unlabeled data that is new, and we will call that inductive learning. OK. Next, we've got the predictive function. OK. And this is just the function that our algorithm is going to be instantiating, which is going to allow us to map from the inputs to the output labels, okay? We know that the prediction function is gonna be part of the hypothesis space. So the hypothesis space is basically every shape that this model can take on. Uh, for each of the, the parameters inside of the model, um, every conceivable you know, uh, um, uh, permutation of, of where, what all those numbers can be in, all of that forms part of the hypothesis space. So our prediction function can only form part of the hypothesis space because you can't pull in other numbers other than the ones that, that already make up your, uh, your predictor function, or at least the, the model that the predictor function is in. Um, the, input, uh, the input instance from the set of inputs. So whenever we're looking at those first two lines, when we um, look at a specific value of X, we're looking at one set of inputs um, inside of the record. And then the label, which is normally going to go with that input instance, is also going to be from the set of labels. Um, and a key takeaway here is that L is much smaller than U, um, meaning that the labeled instances tend to be a lot less than the unlabeled instances. So that's why we want to do semi-supervised learning. We want to be able to label less of the, of the instances, but still get a model that allows us to predict from that. And then finally, there's just a last line. If you drop off that marginal distribution, um, then you can also do what's called transductive learning, where we're saying that we don't actually care about the new instances. What we, what we want to do is take this full data set that we have, of which some of it is labeled and some of it is not labeled, and we only want to apply our model to these instances. So we don't care about new instances. So in the case of AS review that we saw last week, um, that would be an example of transductive learning because we've got this fixed set of uh, academic papers that we're looking at, and we only want to apply the model to that set. We're not going to try and generalize that model to some new um, set of data points. But now, what we see here is that the, the mathematical description of semi-supervised learning is not that different to just supervised learning. Because if you would think about the supervised learning example, you would still have that first line. Um, you just wouldn't have the second line. So you would have labeled data, but no unlabeled data. Okay? So, so it's describing largely the same space. But, but what makes this sort of interesting and why, and why we want to do semi-supervised learning is that when we're 
developing this predictor function. Okay? We want to go through this training process in such a way that the potential predictor function that we want to find, the ideal predictor function that describes this data set most effectively, we want that to bubble up to the top much faster. Okay? So with normal supervised learning, you're taking all of the label data that you have and you're randomly picking um, inputs and you know, making predictions and trying to learn the pattern. But with semi-supervised learning, we want to be a little bit smarter with this and say that we'll start with a base of, of labeled um, uh, records, but we then want to order the inputs of the unlabeled um, records in such a way that this ideal prediction function comes closer and closer to the top of the list. Okay? So what we have now is a collection of labeled inputs, a collection of unlabeled inputs, and then a chosen input. Okay? So in every iteration, we're going to choose from the set of unlabeled inputs some specific input that, that is going to give us the most amount of amount of information that we need to update our model most effectively, okay? And there are a number of ways of, uh, of actually doing this and different techniques can be used, but one of them is going to be active learning. So um, as we've said, active learning is a kind of semi-supervised learning, but here what we're going to do is we're going to start with some of the label, uh, the data being labeled. So a small amount of the data that we have is going to be labeled up front. And then the actual learning that takes place in the model is gonna take place with the human in the loop, okay? So what do we mean by that? We've got, I've got a small um, uh, model there on the bottom, which just shows how this basically works, but we're still gonna use the same kinds of training algorithms that we would use for normal supervised learning. Um, but we're going to just look at the records one by one with an annotator inside of the loop. So on the right-hand side, we've got this pool of unlabeled records. On the left, we've got the pool of labeled records, some of them labeled you know, dark black, some of them um, as white. And we want to just extract, um, in this example, all of the, the, um, the label of records that we find that are marked black. That is what this specific model wants us to do, okay? So um, looking at it again from the mathematical perspective, this is roughly the architecture that we're looking at. So we've got this model, um, which is described by our predictor function, which is going to map the inputs to the, to the output labels. And then we're going to take this fitted model and we're going to pass it to a query strategy. This query strategy is going to look at this model. And then from this list of unlabeled data, which was that second uh, um, uh, uh, expression that we had, it's going to pick one of the unlabeled data points and then say that this relevant unlabeled data input is the one that I think is going to give the most value. It then presents that to the oracle, which is most likely human. In the case of active learning, is pretty much only human. Um, and then that human or, uh, um, annotator is going to add a label. So now, as we go on uh, in time, we find that this labeled data is going to grow and grow and grow, and the unlabeled data is going to shrink. Um, one record at a time, okay? But every time we add a label to one of these data points, we retrain the model, okay? So um, that training step happens before we pass the fitted model back to the query strategy, okay? So um, this is very similar to what happens in supervised learning. It's just that there, when you're looking at something like stochastic gradient descent or, or whatever the case may be, um, generally the labels that you, you look at are going to be ordered random. Here, our query strategy is going to give us more information. Okay. So as you can imagine, this querying strategy is key to active learning um, because the predictive fun function that is going to be generated from this is going to depend pretty much entirely on the label data that we present. So as with normal supervised learning, your model is not going to learn anything that you haven't shown it before. Um, it will only learn based on the things that you have presented to it. Okay, So it's going to depend entirely, this model is going to depend entirely on the, the label data that you presented when it goes through the train. Okay? 
If we present a lot of data that contains the prediction as well as noise, then we're going to need to present a lot more data than if we were to present the targeted label data that will lead to the model being trained optimally to reach the ideal predictor function. I pretty much read that, read that verbatim, um, but that very much encapsulates the, the, the goal that we want to have. We want to organize our data in such a way that it is going to lead to exactly what we want the model to be, rather than forcing it to go through all of the noise um, that, that makes it kind of miss the goal and then reach the goal and miss the goal and reach the goal. Okay, so that's what we're trying to zone in on is that ideal predictor function. Okay, and the way we're going to do this is to select um, an appropriate querying strategy. Okay, so that is this right hand side of, uh, of the model we've got there. Now, as with all the other parts of this, there are a number of different ways in which you can select a querying strategy. Um, here are five examples of that, which we will go through, uh, you know, just, just very quickly. Um, but, uh, but there are more models than this. Uh, there are a number of different query strategies. And in fact, the bulk of research around active learning is actually in this specific area to try and understand how to get the best query strategy for different kinds of data. So of those models or of those querying strategy, the expected model change strategy is that we're going to look at this unlabeled data and we're going to pick the record that would lead to the biggest change in the model. Okay, so we look through each of those records and we say, okay, you know, how much change would, would happen inside of our model if we were to look at this record next and add it to our labeled um, set of data. Okay, so that's what. Another way of looking at this is saying that a prediction is only as good as its error. So the higher the error, the less accurate the prediction is. So if we look at the error of all of the records we've got so far, and we pick inputs that minimize that error for everything we've got so far, then we're using expected error reduction as our querying strategy, okay? The next one is called uncertainty sampling. So here we're going to pick the, the model, uh, pick the input, that our current model is the least certain about what label to give, okay? So um, instead of reinforcing those things that it already knows, you try and find those areas in the data that it doesn't have enough knowledge on yet um, and try and bolster that information, okay? The next one is to do a query by committee. So with this, one, uh, with this technique, you've got more than one model that is being trained at the same time. And each of those models votes on a proposed label for each of the inputs that you, that you give it, okay? And then you pick the input that is the most disagreement between all of these models, okay? So it's similar to uncertainty sampling, just in this case, obviously you've got more than one model that is, uh, that is actually being trained at the same time. And finally, variance reduction, um, very related to um, expected error reduction, but basically you pick those, uh, those inputs that would decrease the output variance the most. And in this case, variance is one of the components of error. It's just a very specific one, okay? So um, as I mentioned, this is not the only uh, set of strategies that can be used. There are lots of approaches that can be taken, but the goal for each of them is to pick the most effective input to label for your training model in each iteration to get to that idealized predictor function. Now, um, something that someone actually mentioned last week, and uh, um, I thought I would just talk on it, is that there is a difference between active learning and reinforcement learning. But there is some similarity in the philosophy of what they use. Um, it's just that the method of feedback is, is fundamentally different. So with reinforcement learning, what you have is some sort of agent that contains a model, and it's going to basically take actions or label something. Um, and it's going to pass that to an environment. So this environment is some sort of simulated system, um, or it could be a real world system that gives you a positive or negative reward based on the action that you just took. Okay. So if that action led to a positive reward, then you want to do more of that sort of thing. If it led to a negative reward, you want to do less to that sort of thing. But you are going through this in an iterative way. 
Okay, with active learning, um, we don't have an environment. We've instead got an oracle, which is the human that is actually labeling the information. So with reinforcement learning, you've got this uh, um, artificial environment that you can run lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of actions against that uh, that thing to get the feedback really quickly and uh, and uh, you know learn from that. Uh, with active learning, you are kind of limited by the human that is labeling things inside of your system. You can obviously have more than one human um, that is doing this, but uh, it's just the philosophy is, is quite different. But from a mathematical perspective, I mean, there are sort of similarities. Um, so I hope that kind of clears, out, uh, clears up uh, any confusion that there was. Now, when looking at this, um, and, and specifically that limit of, uh, of the human in the loop, there are obviously opportunities um, to use active learning in the cloud very, very effectively. Okay? So crowdsourcing of active learning is something that is applied very heavily um, when you're using this technique. And you've probably come across some of it in, uh, in browsing online. Um, a good example of that would be captures where you've got you know, nine images being presented to you and you select which one is a traffic light, for example. Um, that would be an example of labeling data that can be used then in an active learning scenario. But uh, in the last couple of years, there have actually been a, a rise in, uh, in tool sets and chains and APIs that could actually make this a lot easier for you, uh, for you to do things. Um, so a core example here would be Mechanical Turk from uh, Amazon Web Services, but Amazon also has the Comprehend Custom Classification Models. I've added two links there, which actually take you through the full process of how to take an active learning uh, model and go through the full workflow of actually deploying this to the cloud, getting it trained up um, you know, with people annotating it and you know, um, deploying it into whatever uh, workflow it is that you want to use it in. Um, I obviously upload the slides, so you don't need to, to necessarily screenshot this, uh, but this is definitely where I would look at if you're going to, to do things in the cloud. Um, but obviously the cloud is not the only way you can do this. You can also do it uh, on your machine. There are a number of libraries that you can use to perform active learning. Uh, you don't need to use a library. You can actually code this yourself. Um, it is very similar to what you would do with, uh, with supervised learning. As I said, it's just not going through the full list of labeled uh, data. You're just presenting things one by one uh, to the, the annotator. But uh, two popular tools that people use for active learning are Vorpal Rabbit and Modal. Um, with Vorpal Rabbit, it will set up a small little server on your machine that is going to serve uh, examples to you uh, or records to you via a socket. So you will just get it from the socket and then respond with whatever label it is that you want to apply. But with modal, uh, you can just do it in a script. So at this point, assuming nothing goes wrong, I actually just want to take you through a quick demo of how you would use modal to do some active learning. So I'm going to escape here. And uh, let's see if this will work. Okay, can you see my interactive labeling with Jupyter uh, screen? Renee, can you verify that you can uh, see? I can see that, yeah, I can okay. see that. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is actually based on one of the examples that actually comes with, uh, with Modal. Um, it's just their example it uses a very small data set, um, which is very difficult to kind of see the, the results on. Um, so here, what we're gonna do is just do active learning on the 28 by 28 MNIST handwritten digits data set. Um, so this is one of the standard uh, data sets that you would use in machine learning. Um, it's just in this case, instead of teach, uh, teaching a model, you know, everything, we're going to teach it just a couple of values, and then we're going to do the rest in an active learning way. Um, so I've cheated just a little bit. I actually started this um, uh, a couple of minutes before I started my presentation, just because loading up the full MNIST library uh, does take a couple of minutes. 
So I loaded that data set up front, but, uh, but here at the start, uh, I'm just including all of my libraries. Um, so NumPy, Modal, Scikit-Learn, um, and Matplotlib. The next step I'm taking is to load the, the MNIST data set um, with all of its, uh, its, uh, its features. Uh, we do want to get both the, um, the input values as well as the labels so that we've got something to compare to. I'm not loading it as a frame, so it is just going to be a NumPy, um, a NumPy array uh, for the for the x, x's and a NumPy array for the y's. Um, I'm then just uh, it was just to make it work a little bit more effectively um, with the code downstairs. I'm just changing the labels to uh, a NumPy array because when they come straight from the database, they aren't a NumPy array for some reason. They're just a normal list. Okay. Um, so now that I've got my input values and I've got my output um, uh, uh, output labels, I now want to set an initial training set for our classifiers. So with MNIST, you've got 70,000 uh, digits that you can look at. What we're going to be looking at is just 200. Of them. So we set our initial value to 200. And then we say, okay, fine. We're now going to take our data set. Um, that we have, and we're going to split it. We're going to do exactly like we would do for supervised learning. We're going to do a training set and a, a, a testing set, but we also just want to remove that initial set of training values. Okay, so we do the test, uh, uh, train test split, but then from the training set, we're going to pull those two hundred values. Okay, so they're no longer going to be part of our training set. Okay, then we're going to take the, um, the initial X's and Y's, put them into their own uh, little NumPy arrays, and the rest of the values are going to go into a pool. So we're just going to delete all of the initial um, IDs out of that a pool so that we can use that as our unlabeled data sets. Okay, then we initialize the learner. This is what um, modal actually gives you, it's called active learner you use an estimator in this case, because we're doing everything from scikit-learn, um, I'm using the random forest classifier, but uh, modal is, it specifically stands for modular active learning. You can use any kind of classifier you want here. You can also build an extension um, to use a neural network or you know, whatever algorithm it is that you want to use in here. So it's a very extensible uh, library. For our querying strategy, we want to use uncertainty sampling. And then for the initial training that we want to do, we're just going to apply that X initial and Y initial, uh, which is the 200 values that we pulled out. Okay. So that trains up our module, uh, our model initially. And now we're going to say how many queries we actually want to go through um, to make the model better. And this is where our active learning is going to go in. Now, obviously, the more of this you do, the better the model will become. But in terms of our demo for today, I'm just going to do 20 queries. So um, just taking the number of queries we've got. So we're going to do it in a loop. And for each of the, the queries, uh, we want to look at what the digit is that, is that is taken from the pool of digits. We want to show that. And we want to query the, the, uh, the Oracle, which is now going to be myself, for the label. And then we're going to track the accuracy of the model over time uh, to see how it gets better and better or worse and worse. OK. So if I run this, it's going to take a second. It asks me, what's the digital label? OK. So the accuracy at this point in time, based on the first uh, 200 records that it did, um, is just over 77%, and it is now presented me with um, a digit. So I say this is an eight. Okay. Um, now, based on my answer, it is going to, to change the model slightly um, and see what the accuracy it is at that point. So it actually took the accuracy down by a little bit. And now I add the next one. That one took it up. I do a five. I'm just going to go through these and not uh, necessarily narrate the entire experience. 
Um, it's obviously not going to go up every single time, but what we will find, uh, because it's obviously changing the model every single time, but what we will see is that the trend over time is going to be more and more and more positive. So that's, that's what we're specifically looking for. Uh, that's not sure if that's a six or a zero. Um, but as you will see, these are all going to be uh, digits that are really ugly. And the reason for this is that we specified uncertainty sampling. So it's not going to be looking at those digits that are very clearly one of the digits. It is looking specifically for those inputs that it doesn't know what the digits are, because that's going to be where it gets the maximum amount of training from this oracle blocking each of those digits. And two, as you will see, this, uh, this trend of the accuracy is going up and up and up. And three. This is probably a five. Three, up to five, and two, six, that looks like an ugly eight. And I think that is it. Okay, now we can visualize accuracy as a whole. And as we see, there is this, um, this continual growth in the accuracy as we, uh, we train the model over time. Okay, so I now head back to my slides. Uh, where did I lose my slides now? seem to have lost my face. Okay, okay cool. Um, so as we see in our Jupyter notebook, um, nothing went wrong, fortunately, but uh, we had a lot more unlabeled data than we had labeled data. And as we trained the model by selecting the different labels, we could see that the accuracy went up you know, uh, over time. Okay? So this is a great technique that we can use to train a model much more efficiently than we, what we would be able to do with traditional supervised learning, because we can combine the label and the training of, of, the, of the model into one step. Um, so you don't have to go through this whole long process of labeling everything before you start with the model. You can label a part of it, start the model, and then go from there. Um, so there are tools that allow you to do this in your scripts or small applications, or you can scale this up to massive workflows using cloud-based services, as I mentioned, um, which will allow you to put large things into production. Okay, and that is pretty much me, um, short and sweet. So at that point, are there any questions? Okay, anybody has got questions? Uh, I see Tajuzi. Tajuddin is here. Uh, welcome, Tajuddin. Always good to see you uh, at our talks. If anybody has a question, please pop it in the chat or tell me if you want to speak, then I can um, make it possible for you if you want to raise your question, um, you know, live or otherwise just type it in the chat. Tajuddin, uh, let's see who else. Rachel Tatsal is here. Rachel, do you have a question for us? Uh, Hannah Skansel. Trying to see who's here that I know. Okay, Tajuddin, I know.
Rachel Katzel. Okay, who wants to give us a question? Oh, is either super boring or everything was just completely clear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Question. Absolutely. Or, or, yeah. Everything was very clear. Uh, Tajuddin, can you hear me, Rachel? Who can hear me? Who has a question for us? Okay, Martin has got his hand up. Um, yeah, yeah. I, um, well, thank you for a really nice lecture. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you you kept on, you know, continuing the training for the the digits. How what 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 would the the final um, correctness be approximately, or or how how good would this model work? Uh, so in theory, um, you should be able to get to the same level of accuracy. Um, as you would get with supervised learning, um, but hopefully earlier. Um, so at the worst case, it will be basically the same as, uh, as what you would have had with supervised learning. It's just that then you would have labeled every single instance, and it would be basically the same process. It's just that you've done it you know, step by step. Um, but the goal of what you want to do is get to the same level of accuracy that you would have gotten to with, uh, with supervised learning, just a lot faster. Um, but, you know, uh, there, there is quite a bit of research, you know, in this area, because as you saw, um, you know, some of the some of the times when I selected the correct digit, it actually dropped the accuracy as well. Um, so it's not guaranteed that you're catching the model when you finally make the decision to stop at the idealized point. Um, so there is a bit of risk there uh, because you're not using all of the data. Uh, but again, as we saw with the AS review example, um, the idea that we have is to kind of get to a point where the examples we're getting are no longer increasing the accuracy by that much. And then we can start saying, okay, we're likely reaching a plateau on the amount of accuracy that we're going to get. But, but yes, I mean, obviously there is, a, there is a risk if you've got a huge data set um, and you didn't train on a sufficient number of initial data points to represent enough of the classes that you want to classify into that you could miss, you know, large chunks of your uh, of your joint distribution. So that selection of the initial values is actually quite uh, quite important. But presumably, at a certain point, it would sort of asymptote, and and, and that's and, that's and the idea. Yes, getting uh, more. Um, label data wouldn't really help, I, I, I would think. So I guess the question is, uh, how would that compare to a human, you know, um, with a program like this? I mean, some of the digits I thought were rather iffy. Obscure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, obviously it would reach a, a certain point that uh, that more data is no longer adding, you know, all that much value. Uh, but that is true of, of basically all supervised learning uh, activities. Obviously, taking into account um, when you're looking at deep learning and you know very large neural networks, oftentimes the problem is actually not having enough data um, because having to train something huge requires uh, you know a, a similarly large data set. So the MNIST with a random, random forest is actually not a particularly complex model. Um, you know, and it actually doesn't have that complex data. Whereas if you're looking at, you know, uh, uh, proper images of, of a reasonable size of different animals, for example, uh, you would need a massive amount of data uh, to be able to build a classifier of all kinds of animals, for example. Um, so yes, the, 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 the quest for data is, is you know, absolute in, uh, in supervised learning. This just tries to get to an answer a lot quicker than what you would have uh, if you were to label everything from scratch and try and get to a massive data set. So you're also saying that with a bigger model, with a, a, I mean, a bigger, bigger neural model, you would do better. <laughs> um, you would need more data. You would definitely need more data. Um, it will also obviously be quite slow. Um, so it can be a little frustrating. So with this one, um, every single time I made the selection, it was retraining the um, 
uh, the, the random forest. But training a random forest is a lot faster than training a deep neural network. Um, so if you're doing it on a very large model, then the, the querying that it gives you um, will take a couple of seconds or even minutes. Um, so it can be a, a frustrating process if you're doing it by yourself. But that is where this crowdsourcing thing uh, becomes very valuable because then you can present people with examples, um, you know, and there's lots and lots of people that are doing the labeling by themselves and you get the kind of ensemble answer from all of them. Um, you can also, and this is maybe more uh, semi-supervised learning, you can use other classifiers to train your classifier. Um, so I can try and train a small classifier based on something that someone else has trained, which is really, really big, um, that they took the effort to go through a, um, a big label data set. Um, so if I use something like ImageNet um, or YOLO, for example, I can try and train a smaller neural network or a smaller uh, machine learning algorithm um, by labeling some of the data myself and then using their model to actively train my model. I've got a cat that just thanks. So, Yoki, <laughs> I see there's a question from Tajuddin. I'm just going to type it here at the bottom, then it's easy for you to find. How will you carry out the confusion matrix and the ROC? Um, so, uh, if you follow the link that I put in the um, with the Amazon one, I think they actually show that in there as well. Um, but I mean, all of the techniques that you would use for um, for supervised learning work with this as well. Um, so you know, uh, you you can you can you can do your confusion matrix exactly the same way, and that is basically how the accuracy is also captured here that I plotted. Um, so it's exactly the same as supervised learning. It's just that you can imagine it like saying I've done an initial set of two hundred. Um, uh, uh, labeled records, um, and then I did 20 that I did active learning on. So I've now done 220 records um, in my training. Um, so now I can use a testing data set to do the confusion matrix to show, okay, well, how accurate is this now really? Um, whereas in my graph, I just took the accuracy as a whole there, I didn't show the confusion matrix, but you would do it exactly the same way as you would do with uh, with supervised learning. Okay, uh, there's a question. Thank you for answering that. Somebody else asked us, if you have to label data based on active supervised learning, is there any way to arrange uh, unlabeled before? Tajuddin, just okay. help us there with the spelling. What do you mean? Uh, you, yeah. You um, so, so yes, um, and in fact, I think that is the, that is a good idea because I mean, you want to to actively label um, the 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 uh, the the records that the model is the least certain about in in this querying strategy. Okay. So, for that to work effectively, you need to have a good enough distribution of records that capture all of the labels already. Um, so what would have probably been the best way to do the initial training of the MNIST data set is to say, okay, I've got 200 records, for example, and there are 10 digits. So let me select 20 of each of those digits um, and, and label them and then continue from there. Uh, it's just that with the MNIST, there are so many data sets and it is fairly well distributed that taking it randomly would pretty much end up in that result. Uh, but when you're doing it on your own data set, yes, you would absolutely want to get a represent, representative amount of data that you could just kind of start from. That was also, if you remember from last week with AS Review, um, the minimum amount of data that you would need to just set up the model would be one um, relevant and one irrelevant paper. But um, a better situation is to have at least five, for example, to have five relevant and five irrelevant papers. Um, it will absolutely work with just one of each just to kind of set up the two labels, but it's going to take you a much longer time to get to the point where you uh, where you start, uh, you know, losing uh, uh, papers uh, or getting kind of irrelevant papers in a row. It's going to spend a lot more time giving you irrelevant values before it starts really cottoning on with what you actually want to achieve. I, I hope that makes sense. 
Um, I think Tajuddin was asking that. Tajuddin, you can just uh, post in the chat and just tell us if you're happy with that. I'm just taking a look in the webinar chat um, while you were busy, Yopi. I was just asking people to just introduce themselves. It's always interesting for me to see where people are, you know, where they, what universities, where they are, what is their interest, you know, um, just while we're waiting for more questions. Let me just see here. So um, let me just, okay, Rachel Katzel, she was saying she's from UCT and she's interested in medical biology um, machine learning field at the moment. Okay, then also we have somebody from UKZN doing bioinformatics. Uh, Justice Stellenbosch University, TB Genomic, uh, Epidemiology and Dynamic. Uh, let's see here who else we have. Um, okay, Tajuddin was saying he came back to South Africa recently. Uh, in, currently in Bloemfontein, interest is on data stream mining, data science and machine learning. Okay, let's see. Um, and then Johanna from University of Pretoria, interested in um, metabolomics and bioinformatics. I'm going to have to learn what that is, Johanna. Okay, Tajuddin said yes, perfect. Happy with that uh, explanation. Thank you very much, Sharpie. Uh, Martin, do you have something else you think we can add? Because remember, we are recording this, you know, so people afterwards might still be looking at this for many years to come. There might be some other questions you might have in your mind that somebody else might think, or do you think we've covered everything for now? I, I think we've um, pretty much covered everything and, yeah. you know, I would um, encourage people to, um, you, you know, look at some of these links and probably the best way to learn is to try to to do it yourself, <laughs> I yeah. think. Or, Yapi, maybe you have some sort of general advice with how to, you know, learn this. I would go, skills. yeah. I, I would everyone go with, Sort of yeah. wants to get, get in as fast yeah, as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I would say exactly what you just said. Um, try it yourself. Um, you know, uh, you know, take, uh, and I mean, for me, what, what always helps when I'm playing with a new library, um, I, I think it is useful to try and implement active learning yourself. And uh, I will obviously upload the slides and there's a reference to the kind of core paper that, uh, that shows you how to kind of do this from the mathematical perspective, but uh, the libraries are really, really solid. And I find the best way to, to actually get to know a library is to work through their examples and their tutorials. And Modal has some really great examples. Um, so the one that I modified, obviously, for my demo is, is one of them. But they also show you know, how to do regression, how to do you know, just any number of, uh, of learning strategies. The idea with active learning is um, that it is applicable to pretty much any algorithm that you would find in the supervised learning space. Um, so, so I would definitely take whatever example it is that you're currently working on with your data and see if active learning will give you the kind of results that you want faster than you would have gotten if you were to try and label everything manually. Maybe you could, you know, I know you recommended some books to me on, on deep, deep learning that, that, that I um, sort of followed up on and maybe you could share some of those recommendations with other people. Um, so at the moment, my two favorite deep learning uh, books that I would recommend to everyone is, uh, is Grokking Deep Learning by Andrew Trask. Um, so that basically takes you through the process of doing a, a neural network uh, from the ground up. So mm -hmm. it doesn't use any libraries. Um, it's only in like chapter three or four that you even use NumPy. Um, up until that point, you're just using straight Python to try and understand the, the concepts. Um, it really covers the, the ideas of the confusion matrix and, and all of that in a, in a very friendly way. There's very little mathematics required. Um, so I would definitely recommend that book to anyone who is starting out, specifically if you're interested in neural networks. And then uh, Deep Learning with Python. Uh, by Cholette. 
uh, or Cholet. Uh, uh, Martin, you could probably tell me how to pronounce that <laughs> more effectively. I think um, it's Cholet. But I, yeah, I Cholet. I've yeah. heard the spelling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that one actually takes the, the opposite approach. So once you've gone through grokking deep learning, and you now have a very good understanding of how to you know, work with neural networks and what uh, accuracy is and, and all of that, that introduces you to the kind of libraries um, that, that really kick your knowledge into, into high gear. Um, and the focus there is very much deep neural networks and how you can do you know, the different architectures of, of neural networks in you know, uh, great, great, great detail. Um, so at the moment, those are the books that I recommend to everyone. Um, the, for active learning, I would say I haven't found a good book that describes it. There's one or two papers. Um, so the one that's actually linked in this uh, presentation is, is a very good one to, to just sort of understand the mathematical foundation of it. Um, but then for me, I've, I've really kind of gone more through the, um, the modal side of things and really tried to play with it because, and I mean, we see even, even in this presentation, it, it wasn't a long presentation because once you understand supervised learning, self-supervised learning is really just a subdivision of that. Um, and it does everything that you would do with supervised learning, just breaking the steps up into more, into big, you know, smaller steps that have a human in the, in the loop. Um, so once you click that idea, um, I, th I think it doesn't require that much more from a theoretical uh, point of view. Um, it's just about playing um, after that. So I would very much recommend, uh, you know, digging your ha hands into modal and seeing what's possible. Uh, it's a very, very friendly library for, for playing around. That, that would be my advice. 